So my background, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about who I am and why worship is so important to me. So before I came to Christ, my life was crazy. And then I came into Christ, and I did not know who I was in God. I had no idea who God was. But out of a place of worship, he began to show me more of who he is. And as I began to understand more of who God is, I began to understand who I was in Christ and am now today. So as we behold King Jesus, as we see him, as we understand his ways, he begins to show you reflections of your calling and your walk and your gifts and the things that he wants you to walk in. All of you have a calling and a purpose in God. The enemy's number one goal is to keep you away from a lifestyle of worship and to keep your eyes on the things that are just busying us. So God wants you to focus clearly, focus clearly on him. Pursue his presence and get to know him more, and you will get to understand yourself more. I'm a realtor, I'm a worship leader, I disciple youth, and why do I bring up the realtor side? As I began to know God more, I brought him into the details of my life, into every little thing. My whole life is an honor to the Lord. My whole life is worship unto the King. My whole life is yielded to the Lord. And that is worship. That is true worship. It is not just on a stage or singing a song. It is a lifestyle of cultivation when it's hard and when it's easy. God is so relational. You know how you have a good friend, and they just call you up, and they just want to talk to you? Because they, they genuinely just want to know you, and they don't want anything from you. And God desires that kind of relationship. God desires that, that kind of intimacy, where you go to him out of worship simply because you want to know him. And as you get to know him, you're going to experience the delight of heaven and your identity as sons and daughters. God is causing some of you to even be, become alive, to getting to know him more. I just feel the pressure of heaven God pushing you, the weight of God pushing you, each one of you, into his presence. He's pushing you into a place of overflow. He's pushing you into a place of revival. He wants the details of your life. He wants every little detail. So I felt like a nobody. I felt like I was disqualified. But through a place of worship, through a place of intimacy with the Father, he began to show me the deposit of heaven. And then these miracles started to break out in my life. There's miracles that God wants you to walk in. How many of you want to see miracles in your life? Absolutely. Hallelujah. He says yes and amen to that. So I kept pursuing Christ. I kept saying, okay, God, I want to know you. I'm learning his voice daily, daily. So some of you, I believe, are going to burn brighter for God after this message. Some of you are going to be tempted to resist the Holy Spirit. Go, eh, I don't know if that's for me. But as you're open to the Holy Spirit, He's going to continue to pull on that deposit so that you can walk in signs and wonders and miracles out of a place of intimacy and worship. So, back to Matthew 19, 26. Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All right, let's say that all things are possible. All things are possible. Yes, it's possible through God. Possible. I'm going to tell you a story about one of my coworkers. So again, I'm inviting God into the details of my life. I'm listening to his whispers. I'm going after his heart just out of love and adoration. Yes, he still wants the moments where you're down and you need him. He desires to take the burdens. We must go to him out of desperation and heartbreak and hardship. 
But we must also go to him when we're in a great place, when we're steady and firm. He wants the both and, not the either or. So I'm at this, I'm, I was working for a mortgage bank, and I'm always telling stories about Jesus to my coworkers as the Lord opens the door. I'm not, I don't just walk up into my workplace, Jesus has arrived! <laughs> oh! You know, like, oh, no, wait, 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 time out. Like, turn it down just a second. Like, there's, there's an honor that you can walk into a room and know that the King of Glory is with you, and you don't even have to announce it. But out of your lifestyle, there's going to be overflow. There must be overflow. You must walk in the things that seem impossible because God is with you. God desires to reveal himself through you to your coworkers. So my coworker, I, I'm telling stories, and one day she comes to me and she's like, Hey, Yolanda, my friend has uh, her son. So my friend's son has a tumor, and it's going to kill him. It's life-threatening. Can you just pray for him? Like, and I was like, yeah, let's pray. So I invited her into that, right? So she became a participant. So I'm like, all right, let's pray together. So we join hands. We're in a workplace, right? Now, I will caveat that, right? You're not just going to spend an hour on the clock trying to pray, right? This needs to be these moments of just having general conversation like you would talk about football or your day, right? These just quick moments where the Lord is invited in because it's a lifestyle of worship. So we join hands real quick. It was like maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute max. I'm like, in Jesus' name, we curse that tumor. We declare that it would shrivel up and die and that this child would live. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. She's like, praise God. Thank you. I'm like, okay, cool. And then, literally, it was two months later, month by month, that tumor shriveled up and died. And that boy lived. Come on. Come on. That's, that's the God of the impossible, where we're inviting him into the details, and he's showing up. So I'll give you another story of the God of the impossible. So I live in a duplex. I rent one side out. And so I had somebody working on this uh, dryer. And this man was actually a Mormon. I was like, cool, I'm going to talk about Jesus as the Lord opens the door. I don't just shove it down this way. I'm just living a lifestyle of worship and honor to the king. And so I start telling him, yeah, testimonies. He's like, how are you? I'm so good. God's amazing. He's doing amazing things right now. He is. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm seeing God heal and restore. Really? Can you pray for my cousin? This is it. The morning is asking me to pray for his cousin. I was like, absolutely. What, what does he need? He's like, well, he's been non-responsive for two weeks. And he, we're not going to sure, we're not sure he's going to wake up and live at all. I was like, sure, sure, let's do this. And so I just grabbed hands. I was like, let's pray. So we grab hands. And I'm like, all right, Jesus. We believe and declare life over this man in Jesus' name. And as I'm praying, I'm inviting the Holy Spirit to speak. And sometimes as I'm praying, the Holy Spirit will override even my words. In Psalms 81, we were talking about it as a team. It says, open your mouth and I will fill it. When you don't know what to pray, invite the Holy Spirit in and open your mouth and he will fill it. So I'm holding the hands of this uh, more of an electrician. And I'm like, okay, God, kill this man. In Jesus' name, we declare by tomorrow night that he would wake up and he would, be, he would live in Jesus' name. And the electrician, I don't know even why I said that, but the, I opened up my mouth and God filled it. So the next night, he calls me and he was like, hey, what are you doing? I was like, I mean, I'm working. What are you doing? Hello? And he was like, you won't believe it. I was like, what? He was like, he is sitting up right now, Woo! pointing at yes. He can't really say her name, but he's awake. Two weeks of nothingness to now an alive man. He had to learn how to walk again. He had to learn how to talk again. But I invited God into the situation, into the details of my life, because I'm practicing worship. I'm practicing 
this intimacy with the Father, not just in my secret place, but out in the open. We understand the depth, the magnitude, the wisdom of God in one-on-one time with God. But we can't just keep him there. We cannot keep him bound just in the shadows of our one-on-one time with him. We must bring him out into the open. And we must invite other people to hear the testimony of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying you have to prophesy and do all these things every single moment of every single hour. You must live and enjoy life. But invite him into the details. And God will open doors for you to minister. So we're taking risks in the Holy Spirit. And for me, it's, it's been a process of learning how to go to God in my emotional distress. So if some of you... You just get busy. Most of the time when we have emotional distress, we go to something. Sometimes it's food. Sometimes it's movies. Sometimes it's conversation with other people. But I've learned how to take those emotions and go, okay, I'm not channeling it there. I'm going to channel it into worship until God meets me here, until he changes my mindset about this, until he shows me who I am and the truth of who he is in me. So the goal, the goal is his heart to be released to others. I'm just going to pray for you. I'm going to continue on in the word. But in Jesus' name, God, I thank you for the power of your love that is resting upon each and every one of your daughters, that you're pushing them into a place of intimacy. You're pushing them into a place of wanting you, into a place of coming into this understanding of their identity, as sons and daughters of the Most High God, who releases the kingdom of God on earth and takes back territory, where the enemy would try to tell you, this is not your territory. You are taking back territory. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you, Lord Father. We bless you in Jesus' name. So we must live as Jesus lived. 1 John 2.5 says, 1 John 2.5, But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. So there's obedience first. Some of you are struggling in sin, and we'll copy out this, saying if you're struggling, go to leaders. Go to those who are discipling in this church and get get the keys of understanding to come out of bondage. Obedience is beautiful. Obedience is simple, and it is powerful. So, This is how we must know we are in him. Verse 6. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus lived. How many of you claim to be in Christ? Come on, let me see those hands. Yep. You must, you must do what Jesus did. You must. There is a mandate in this word for you to do the things that Jesus did to walk in the power of the kingdom. So what did Jesus do? Acts 10 and 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So what did Jesus do? He healed all who were under the power of the devil. There's a many to heal the sick, raise the dead. Cleanse lepers, cast out demons, right? This is, this is a lifestyle of worship and honor unto the king. You must do what Jesus did. So I'm going to caveat that real quick. Because some, some are like, well, isn't, isn't healing like a gift? Yes, <laughs> there's a gift of healing. But even with that, I never had the gift of healing. It was pursuit in his presence. It was pursuit of worship for me to simply understand who I am and who he is. And out of that place, then I began to see miracles, signs, and wonders. So, let me tell you some more, just testimonies of the the power of the gospel and how I'm telling these great stories and the power of Jesus. But I also want to invite him into just everyday lifestyle. 
So I got my eyesight checked, and there was a clerk worker, and I'm, I'm asking the Holy Spirit constantly, what are you doing, and what are you saying? What do you want to do for this person in front of me? If you want to speak, God, I'm willing. If you want to do something, God, I'm willing. And so I'm paying attention. I'm just, that's all I'm doing is I'm paying attention to him as I'm walking and doing life. And if it's with your children, just invite him into your day and say, Holy Spirit, do you want me to speak something to my kids right now? Do you want me to lay hands? Do you want me to prophesy something? I'm inviting you in to speak. So here I am getting my eyes worked on. And I met the clerk worker, and I felt like I was supposed to do something as an act of kindness to her. And I felt like I was supposed to go and buy her a booklet and a ring, just a small ring. And I was like, okay, I I don't know what kind of booklet that is, but it was a journal. So I left the store and said goodbye. She didn't know I was going to come back and bring this booklet. So what I did is I left and I, I bought that and I wrote in there prophecies and destiny and purpose to someone I do not know. Right? Because I'm inviting the kingdom of heaven to be released. And I came back and I gave it to her and she was like, what? This is the most kind thing. And I kid you not, for the next two to three years, definitely two years, I can't remember if that like third one rolled around, it was like the end of the two and a half, but she consistently talked about those prophecies. I would call her up and I like sometimes I forget about these things, but I would call the phone up to schedule an appointment because over a course of time, and she'd be like, "Hey, it's me." And I'm like, "Me?" She's like, "You, you gave me that that journal and, and ring." She's like, "I read that every day, and I journal in that." And my sister, I told my sister about this journal, and it's it's touching her life. What? Right? These little things that we can do that God God wants to move. I can tell you so many stories. All right, here's one more story about just the power of God in not having to be on a stage. We do not need to be on a stage to walk in the kingdom and to release the kingdom. So here I am at a Jesus Culture worship concert, and I'm just worshiping. And first, this lady's like super close to me and kind of like bumping me because it's like it's so packed. I'm like, Okay, worshiping, you're about making. Okay, I'm trying to roll this. And I was annoyed. Um, but, but seriously, the Holy Spirit was like, love her and pray for her. I was like, oh, okay. All right, let's do this, God. All right, whatever you want, whatever you want. And I kid you not, that lady had a stomach pain, and God healed her from that stomach pain. I turned and I was just blessed. I just, I got out of myself out of my mindset, out of the go land, out of the, you're touching me, back off, you know? Yeah. Like, it's, it's seriously, because I think we're trained in that, like, get out of my bubble. And it's like, God wants to invite other people into that space. I wish I could give you guys a magnifying glass of how God sees you. Because we look in a mirror, and we just see, just dimly. And God's like, let me focus in, just like a camera lens, just focusing in. And I believe when, when we are able to see in the spirit, what we're carrying is bigger and greater, so much greater than what we're looking at in the mirror. It's eternity. It's the deposit of eternity in you. The hope of glory is in you. So if you guys look in the mirror the next time, Open your heart to God. Show me this God of eternity that lives in me. I want to know you more. Man. So that lady gets healed. Then I'm in worship again. I'm like, okay. And she kind of moves away this time. So she's not like bumping me now. I was like, oh, that's really cool. She got healed. And now I'm like able to worship her. It's fine. And then the Lord's like, look over there. And so I'm listening to the details. I'm just bringing him in. I'm adoring the king, but I'm listening to the whispers. And so I see this man in a wheelchair, and I was like, ooh, is he going to get up? Let's go. And God's like, go pray for him. So I did, and I prayed for him. Now, did he get up fully from the wheelchair? No. But all of the pain in his body completely left from 
head to toe. We're, I'm at a Jesus culture concert, and normally we're like, yeah, just bless me, God, bring it on me, right? Which is good. We must adore the king, and we must have him show us a reflection of who he is to us, right? But once you grasp that, once you get it, now he wants you to release it. So, <laughs> this man in the wheelchair gets healed. And so I just I go back to worshiping God. And I'm like, what? Let's go. I'm just, in a, you know, on the side. Worship's happening. And next thing I know, the Lord's like, someone has a headache around you. I was like, really? I was like, oh, I wonder who it is. So I'm practicing in the spirit. I'm practicing hearing and listening to his voice and obeying. So I turn and I go, hey, man, do you happen to have a headache? She was like, no, but my son does. I was like, oh, okay, there's something around me, but here we go. And so this kid is playing on his video game. I was like, hey, buddy, like, I felt like God showed me that somebody here had a headache. I feel like the God wants to heal you. And he was like, okay. I was like, can I pray for you? He was like, sure. So I prayed for him, boom, immediately gone. He was like, it's gone. It was like, praise God, he loves you. And he's like, thank you. And he kind of went back to his video game. It was great. I was like, okay, now I'm back in a place of worship. I'm like, okay, God, whatever you're doing, I like it. Now, this lady comes over to me because she's watching the Spirit of God moving. And people are drawn into the power of God, into the presence of God. They want the kingdom. So she brings her son over, and her son is um, disabled. And I'm like, okay, God, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to pray. And she goes, he's a drummer. And I was like, okay, but that's a key. That's a key for your heart. God, I'm believing it. I'm going to open my mouth. You're going to fill it. So I start praying for this kid. And you could see him light up. He was like, yeah, that's me. And I'm declaring the identity of a father into him. Sometimes we see the power of the gospel released with our words immediately. And other times, we release the power of the gospel, and it comes in time, in seed and sowing. Do not nullify the power of the gospel that you carry. And when you do not see it, continue to believe that he is able, that he's the God of the impossible. We will not let our present situation define the glory and the greatness of God. Whether he responds right now or later will not define how great our God is. Surely our God is great. So in practicalities of just like speaking, like Yolanda, how do you, you know, how do you just speak to people? And I'm gentle. I'm just, I just, I'm loving because that's the Father that has loved me. When I'm going out and I, I talk, I pray for a lot of people and. Oftentimes, I see a lot of breakthrough because I'm just listening to his whispers. It's a lifestyle of worship that leads to this revival. So, here, it's the, the key. The key is his presence and praying and spending time with him. How many of you are with me? How many of you are with me in this? Come on, let's go. So you're listening, you're hearing. And oftentimes, when I'm when I feel like I'm just supposed to have a conversation with someone, but I don't know what God is supposed to do, it's a highlight. God has highlighted someone to me. And what do I mean by highlight? There's a drawing, and I don't know why. I'm like, huh. And usually it's not because they're handsome, right? Like, it's, they're, <laughs> so I was like, oh, yeah, it was usually, oh, okay, she said for her it's usually. <laughs> so anyway, but the reality is, is there's something. There's just I'm not sure why my eyes keep going that direction. I'm not sure what's on that person. But I'm just going to listen to the whisper of God. And I'm going to allow him to speak. And so my first usual phrase when I'm talking to somebody that I don't know is, hey, I'm a Christian. I've seen God move in my life. Is there any way I can pray for you? If I'm drawn and I don't have anything prophetic, very simple. I'm a Christian. I've seen God move a lot. Is there any way I can pray for you? Basic, basic, but also a key. Mm, I have so many testimonies written down here, but in the interest of time, right? <laughs> like, so one thing I will say about our prayers and the power of the gospel 
is that we may never lead a legion of people, but we, through our prayers, influence a legion of angels. We cultivate intimacy in the secret place, and he begins to release the kingdom and angels on assignment in that kingdom. And we may never stand before kings and prophesy or minister to kings, but we always get to minister to the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And then we release him to people around us. So every morning and every night, my lifestyle is, is cultivated in intimacy. He's the first thought on my mind. He's the last thought on my mind. And I made a conscious decision to want him above fleshly desires. To desire him more than whatever the world is offering me. And that is the worshiping army that God wants to call forward. He is searching for true worshipers. How many true worshipers do I have? Oh, come on now. That's it. You are a true worshiper of the most high. And you're joining in the army. This is a spiritual battle. And you are called to take territory in the kingdom of our God. The most costly worship, the most costly worship is when I've been at my lowest or most emotionally exhausted place. And I worship him anyway. And I worship him until my heart gets healed. And sometimes it takes months. Sometimes it even takes years. My mentor passed away and it crushed me. She was closer to me than even my mother. She shepherded me in the things of faith and she died and it crushed me. But I made a decision when I don't understand what's happening or why that happened. I'm not going to say God is not good. I'm going to go to God and believe that he is still good, that he is still powerful, that he is still a healer. And I'm going to cultivate intimacy in the secret place because he is the healer of brokenness and hardship. He is. So, ministering practically, you know, I'm just going to just say a couple of these things as we're living a lifestyle of worship to get your focus off yourself and on to God. So practically, it looks like sometimes giving things away, jewelry, paying for someone's food, or stepping out in faith, just praying, quick prayers, like, hey, or one word, it's like, hey, I feel like today, God says, light, and that's your word, or a sentence or a phrase. Ask God for pictures for people. Ask God, what does that mean? As I was praying about today, in the spirit, what I felt like, I saw angels with apples. And some of you, he was handing out. He was like, here, they were different colors. I was like, God, what is that? He was like, they're gifts in the spirit. They're gifts of keys. And you guys were taking the keys. And some of you, he literally, like, angels were throwing them. <laughs> he was like, you, you're getting a key. <laughs> but I'm asking, I'm seeking, so ask for pictures. And don't nullify it if it's, a, if it's a quick vision. If it's something that's like, oh, well, I don't really know if that's God. That's just kind of something that popped in my head. Pay attention. If it popped in your head and it's not something that's normal to you, it most likely is God speaking. And if it's good, it's usually God. Okay. So oftentimes here's a phrase that I say. God, who do you want to bless right now? God, who do you want to bless right now? I'll be in church and I'll be listening to the sermon, but I'm activated in, in faith. I'm saying, God, who do you want to bless right now? And then he will start to highlight people to you. And use testimonies of faith. So just like I, I gave you testimonies today, and even if it's an old testimony in your own life, pull it back out and say, hey, this is what God has done for me. Can I pray for you? Very simple. So if you haven't seen a miracle yet in your own life, you can pull from other miracles. Even at this conference, 
We've seen multitudes already healed. You're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders. Pull out those testimonies and release them. Um, on the streets, I want to say that you want to keep your eyes open, practically speaking, for people. Um, demons will manifest and demons will move. You know, you don't want to get clocked if you have your eyes closed. Now, I'm not saying that one. <laughs> but keeping your eyes open on the streets, right? If you're drawn to somebody on the streets, just keep your eyes open. Uh, forgiveness is a key of ministering practically. So they say 75% of people that get prayed for for physical healing have an undertone or something connected to forgiveness. So if you're like, man, I'm praying for this person for healing and I'm not seeing breakthrough yet, using declarative prayers, nothing's changing, like, huh, maybe it's forgiveness. And sometimes... You can just ask them and ask the Holy Spirit. Is forgiveness something that they, they need to like give some, that give that up to you, God? Is that something you want to deal with right now? Just ask, hey, is there anybody you need to forgive? That's another key. And sometimes it's a conscious decision. That's one I want to say conscious decision. Because I think we wait for God to say, yeah, it's time, now you go. If the minister doesn't give you the go, then most of us don't. But consciously decide to listen and respond. And then ask people, especially for people that you don't know, don't just stick your hand on them. Sometimes they feel uncomfortable. Just say, hey, is it okay if I put my hand on your shoulder? Most people are like, yeah, sure, I'll care. Some are like, well, I guess. They don't know that we lay hands on the sick and they get well. They don't know that we're literally going to transfer the kingdom of God into that darkness. <laughs> and another key for um, practically ministering, especially in healing, I'm going to switch to healing in particular, uh, but testing it out. So forgiveness and healing and also testing it out. That's one thing that I've even found in my own life. It is often hard to pray for somebody you don't know once and then do it again. But usually on the second or third time, that's when things get unlocked because they start to feel the presence of God. They start to go, oh, something is happening. I'm acknowledging that. Jesus prayed again. That's a key. And most of the time, the biggest breakthroughs that I've seen in other people's bodies, like endometriosis, um, liver cancer, these they're usually prayed more than once, I will say. So that's a key. Pray and pray again. Test it out. So if you say, hey, Yolanda, I just don't know what to say, I would say you have the mind of Christ. You do have the mind of Christ, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick, and so you're going to allow God to move through your prayers, and the Lord will raise them up. That's what it says in James 5.15, the Lord will raise them up. So our job is to pray. It's God's job to raise them up. And if you want to see God move, we must believe and respond. I'm going to give you just a few more scriptures because we're going to close out here. But Mark 9, 23, if you can't, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. There's, and the opposite is true. Nothing is possible for the unbeliever. So we want to come into this place of faith, and it's found in a lifestyle of worship. And we look at unbelief in the kingdom of God, and even Jesus himself could not perform many miracles because of that doubt and unbelief. And that's where, for me, doubt and unbelief is often combated through worship, where you're like, man, I just don't know. And you're like, I'm going to spend time in the presence of the Lord, and he's going to help me combat doubt, the, the voices of doubt. And I can tell you stories about doubt and believing those lies. But in John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice and know them. So where unbelief will tell you you're not worthy, you can't pray for people, there's a you know, fear or whatever it is, you know the voice of your father because you are his sheep. And if you say you're like, hey, I'm an introvert, that's just not who I am, I would say that God is greater than any insecurity. God, uh, he is the one who heals, right? And if God is in you, you can pray for the sick and you can watch the sick get well. So this one last scripture I want to leave with you and then we're going to pray is Jeremiah 1.6. This is, ah, 
Lord God, I said, Jeremiah 1, 6. Ah, Lord God, I said, I surely do not know how to speak, for I am only a child. You're like, God, I don't know how to pray for people that like that. Like, I, I don't know how to do this. And verse 7 says, but, but the Lord God told me, don't say I am only a child. God wants to shift your vocabulary now. He wants you to say, no, I am a child of God. Now, walking in the power of the kingdom, and I'm going to release the power of the kingdom everywhere I go. 